Well, half the year is over. Today's the last day of June. And we move into the second half, and it always gets more fun as you move into the second half. You get through summer, then the fall comes, excitement builds, you lead up to Christmas, and just all the energy. But well, we won't go to Christmas quite yet, so. <laughs> Other than our Christmas in July. Well, our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter, beginning in the 51st verse. Hear now these words. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. And on their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever heard, overheard a part of a conversation that kind of made you want to get up and leave? That you overheard something and don't have all the story? Well, a few years ago, the Lexington Herald-Ledger of Lexington, Kentucky, published a short list of classic conversation stoppers. This, uh, these, if you overheard these phrases, I think the urge to get up and move would be overwhelming. One of them, for example, what would you do if you heard this? Contagious. Contagious, I asked the doctor, and he says back, yes, really contagious. Or this one, so that's it. As of this morning, I quit my medication. Homicidal tendencies, my foot. And then there's this one, you're sitting in it now. Not sure what I would do if I was sitting next to someone in some place and overheard one of those three phases, whether I would finish up what I was doing and move along. Well, our gospel lesson this morning is a short section that Luke inserts about Jesus on the move. And the overriding question from this passage is, will you go where Jesus is going? As our whole lives, Jesus is calling us to follow him. And to go where He is. And it's not usually a geographic movement. Although sometimes it is to relocate. But for most of us, when Jesus calls us to follow Him and go where He has, it's doing it in our own community, but in a way that we never saw before. And very often when we hear that call to come, we struggle with that response. But Lord, there's something else going on. Where we're kind of... I see where you're calling me and it scares me. Or I don't like those people. See, that was the problem in this first instance. In the first instance, Luke, we see that Jesus is passing through Samaria from Galilee to Jerusalem. And He has His face set on going to Jerusalem. And we know that the Samaritans and the Jews don't like each other. And so when Jesus sends His disciples ahead of Him to kind of get everything ready to a city they see, no, he's just stopping here on his way to Jerusalem. We aren't going to help you go to Jerusalem. We don't like that place. We don't like that people. And so they don't want to be a part of Jesus' journey. And we see that because Luke has overemphasized this. He says it that after this, Jesus set his faith towards Jerusalem. This is the turning point in the gospel where Jesus is now headed to the cross. And see, that's the other thing where we don't really like to follow Jesus because He's headed to the cross. He's taking us to our own cross to pick it up and to follow Him. And that can get scary sometimes. 
And we don't respond to God's call because the place Jesus calls us to. We just don't like it. Why would anyone put themselves in that condition willingly? Marilyn's father was a pastor. Uh, he was a second career pastor. He went in when he was about 40, decided to go back to school like I did. And he served churches in Texas and Kansas and Florida. Well, when Marilyn was in about ninth grade, is that ninth grade right? When you moved from Kansas, I got to remember these things a long time ago. She moved, his, the family moved from Kansas to Florida. And his father agreed to take a church that was known as a clergy killer church. We have those terminology for some congregations. <laughs> Pastors, oh, they're clergy killers. And people said, why are you going there? Why are you going to that church? Marilyn's dad had two reasons. One, he had taken Marilyn's mom away from Florida and her family. Marilyn's mom is a Florida native. She was born here in Florida up there in Lottie, but she moved to the big town of whatever, whatever's down from Lottie. No, she was Stark. That's right, the big town of Stark when she was three. I'll talk about this. Huh? Yeah, this is their big prison. He said that was one reason. He wanted to move and get her back close to the family. But the other thing, he says, I think I can help this church to get over their ways, to be an effective church. And Marilyn's mom and her dad were double tithers. This is how much they believed in trusting God. They gave 20% of their income to God. Marilyn and I haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, but they did this. And so they got there and he was working this church. And when he turned 62, see, this was the disciples of Christ. They're a called church. They're not appointed like we are. When he turned 62, a group of the church got together and said, we want a younger pastor. And there was a move to out him. And he could have fought it, but he decided not to fight it. And so he left willingly. And at the age of 62, three years before when he wanted to retire, he was put out of his job. And so for the next three years, he did interims around there. And he, he tried to go all over the country just to get to his retirement. And when you look at a call like that on his life, why would you go to a place that will hurt you like that. But the real hurt and the call came about four years later. See, the pastor they retired and the younger pastor got them, spent all their money and got them in horrible financial trouble. And so the church came back to Marilyn's dad about four years later and said, will you come back and be our pastor at half your salary you were before? You ask the average person, they say, why would you do that? But Marilyn's dad knew that he was called to do that, and he went. And he brought them back life again and built them up. That's interesting. This is exactly what happened to John Calvin. All those Calvinists out there were following that. In 1536, um, the reformer William Farrell recruited him to come to Geneva, Switzerland, to pastor St. Peter's Church. And Calvary, he was kind of a sickly man and he just wanted to go off to Stroudsburg and just be a quiet scholar. But when he got this request to go to this pastor, he says, okay, if you need me, I will go there. And he went and served it. And two years later, the, the city council people were so upset with him. The church leaders were so upset with him, they drove him out. And so he went back to Stroudsburg to be a quiet scholar. And three years later, they call him up and say, you know, we're in a real mess. Will you come back and be our pastor? And people said, you're going to go back? And he said, I didn't want to go back. But this is what he wrote about. It. He says, I didn't want to go back yet because I know that I am not my own master. I offer my heart as a true sacrifice to the Lord. See, we struggle to go with Christ. To go where he's going because it doesn't seem like a good place sometimes. He calls us to those places where people say, you're going where? Why? It's because we're called. Marilyn's dad retired. His mom lived, he lived into his mid-80s and she lived in 93 and they never wanted once for finances. They never touched the principle of their retirement because God blessed that they went where they were called. 
Calvin was blessed where he went. They still, people still study his writings and teachings today because he went where he was called. And this incident became the motto of Calvin's life. His emblem would include a hand holding out a heart to God with the inscription prompte et sincere, which means promptly and sincerely. Promptly and sincerely, Calvin answered a call to a difficult task. And that's what God calls us sometimes to fall in something that looks difficult. But He gives us the strength and the power to get through it and to bless us. And then we see that Luke has these three quick encounters with people who come to Christ or Christ calls them to follow Him and it looks, it appears like they don't go. We never know if they really went or not. We are left hanging. Did the people say yes even after what Jesus said? We're kind of hung there. And this first one's kind of a strange response. God comes up, I want to go with you, Jesus. And Jesus says, so great, I'm glad to have you on board. No, he says, you know, you know, some animals have a place to live, but I ain't got a place to put my head down. And you'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking I want to follow you and you give me this cryptic thing. But what Jesus was trying to sell him, are you willing to be unsettled? See, to follow Jesus, we have to be willing to be unsettled. It won't always be perfect. It won't always be as we expect it to be. But it will be blessed. It will be blessed. Are we willing to be unsettled? You know, as I said, thankfully, when God calls us to follow, it isn't always about leaving home. But sometimes it is. when In the Methodist church, when you're called to be a pastor here, you're called to be an itinerant pastor. And that means you go to the churches where you're called to go. And I can tell you that's kind of unsettling. It's, it's unsettling for the churches. You know, y'all are getting a new pastor. What's that going to be like? Is it going to be weirdo? That... Well, it's also unsettling for the pastors. <laughs> Marilyn and I go where we call. We pack up and move. We go live in a house we didn't pick out. And for me, it's very unsettling because I have a learning disability. I was diagnosed with this learning disability when I was in kindergarten. And they said, you know, I should be put in this program to overcome it. And my parents said, well, we don't have that kind of money, so we'll just pray for him that he'll turn out all right. <laughs> and I've learned over the years that I'm dyslexic and I have trouble memory. And one of the worst things I have that's unsettling to go to a new church is I am one of the most horrible people in remembering names. I know I'm going to irritate people because I'm going to get your name wrong. To tell you how bad I am about remembering names, I'm going to confess one of my deepest shames. I have gone to five, at least five different homes to visit somebody. Now, if you're going to home, you should know who you're going to visit to, right? You look it up, you see their address, you go to the, you spend time visiting them. And when I go to pray, when I leave, I use somebody else's name. Talk about unsettled and embarrassing. And I know over the years I've hurt people because I didn't remember their name right away. I, I'm... My mom used to say, he's a slow learner, but once he learns it, he gets it down. But names just, it struggles me. But what I do know in following Jesus and being unsettled, that he's led Marilyn and me to places we would have never gone, to meet people we would have never met, to be blessed in ways we would have never been blessed if we didn't go. And that's the way it is with Jesus, what he's saying. Are you willing to be unsettled? But in your unsettlement, I will find you blessing. And I've seen this over and over in church that, that people go, well, I'm really not sure if I want to do this ministry or if I want to go on that mission trip. But when they do it and they meet the people, they go, wow, that was so exciting. I was so blessed to do it. And you're trying to tell me, I was trying to tell you that up front. You were all scared because you were nervous, not sure where you were going to go. And at the end of it, you're blessed. That's what Jesus does when we follow him. And the next two encounters by Christ deal with the excuses we make. And the excuses don't seem to be bad excuses. They seem to be very relevant ones. I, I got to go bury my dad. Now, most scholars believe that his dad was not dying or yet. It was just, I have to go and be obedient to my dad. And when I fulfill that obligation, I will follow you. 
And the other one simply says, you know, let me go say goodbye to my folks. And Jesus gives them another quip, you know, if you can't plow a straight line while you're looking backwards. And I think Jesus says each has a problem. Are we willing to let go to follow Jesus? See, Luke is also contrasting this to the calling of Peter, James, and John that we find in, the, in Luke chapter 5, which reads, When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had just taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Desbedee, Simon's partners. But then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on the shore and left everything and followed him immediately. We see that with Peter, James, and John, they simply left all behind. They didn't say goodbye to their dad. You know, like, dad, here are the boats. There, you'll find them, I'm sure. We're gone. Now, it doesn't mean they left their family entirely, that they never saw them again. We know that Peter was in the house of his mother-in-law. That's how we know Peter's married. Because he went to visit him. His mother-in-law was sick, so he healed her so she could fix some food for them to eat. I always laugh at that every time I see it. She got there, oh, she's sick. Heal, get on, go get some food because we're hungry. If you don't think there's humor in the Bible, you're not reading it properly. But God knows it's the things that we leave behind. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talked about these fears. He said, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus knows our needs and our desires. But he also knows that God's desire for us is to live the best life possible. But he also calls us to be on this journey with Christ. And that's where we find the best life possible. And the problem with journeys, if you've ever been on a long road trip, they never go exactly as you planned. I love the way one pastor summed it up. He said, there's always some bad news. Construction delay, bridges collapse, flat tires, flooded roadway, lost luggage, credit cards decline. But then he made the point, but committed travelers keep going. When the troubles come, they don't go, let's just quit, this trip isn't worth it, we're going home. No, they had a purpose. And they know their destination, but as disciples, we just know there's a journey and we don't know the destination. That's the most unsettling part is we don't know where God is leading us when He says, come to do this. We don't know the end result. All we can do is be faithful and say, yes, I will go. I will serve you. I will embark on this wonderful journey. And the thing we have to remember when we go on this journey with Christ, it is always going to lead us into meeting some very lonely, hurting people. Because I found that if you want to be where Jesus is, go where the hurting people are in. Go to the smelly places. Go to the dirty places. Because Jesus is already at work there talking to those people. And He's calling us to join with Him. See, Jesus asked a simple question our whole life. Will you follow Me? And He hopes you will say yes. He is not going to force you. It's a free choice we make. But if you say yes, the one thing Jesus says you will find is life. Life eternal. Life with complete peace. A life of joy. Even when the world says you shouldn't be enjoying it. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your peace. Lord, we thank you that you call us to this wonderful journey. That you call us to follow you, to go with you wherever you lead us, even to the cross. Even to places where we're uncomfortable and unsettled. Because Lord, when we follow you, you also tell us that we will find joy there. We will find peace. We will find life. And we will find strength to get through each day. 
So Lord, give us that power, that strength to follow you, to love you as you love us, to love others. Help us to serve as you served us. We pray this in your son's most precious holy name. Amen.